Good afternoon. This is Ben Siegel with Privacy Ref. I want to welcome all of you to our webinar today on kickstarting a privacy program. I just wanted to start off, basically introduce you to the webinar and get some of the uh, housekeeping out of the way as well. So we're going to do that first. Then I'm going to go over about Privacy Ref, introduce our speaker, Bob Siegel. We'll go from there. Um, first things first, we're going to email a copy of the slides to everyone in attendance today. So at the end of this uh, edit this webinar, just wait by and we will send over those slides to you. Uh, additionally, during the webinar, if you have any questions, uh, just use the GoToMeeting uh, interface and our questions there. Uh, but you can also ask questions through Twitter using at PrivacyRef. Uh, it's just the company name with an ad symbol for it for Twitter. Um, finally, at the end of the webinar, what we're going to do is send out a survey to you this we use to improve our webinar, make it better for the next time we go around and find possible new topics. So please make sure to fill that out so we can improve our webinar as well, make it, make it better every time. So about Privacy Ref, what we are, we're a privacy consultancy. We really focus on developing and implementing privacy policies and other privacy-related agendas and programs for our clients, uh, helping organizations really to adjust and adapt to new regulations from the government and policies. Uh, we focus on three areas of assessments, things looking at uh, privacy assessments in general or your breach policies, consulting, helping to develop those policies, and doing training as well. Uh, our CEO and founder is Bob Siegel. He has extensive professional experience in the development of privacy policies and procedures, the development of performance metrics to evaluate privacy maturity, and the evaluation of compliance. Uh, he has extensive experience with PCI DSS and Safe Harbor and has deep subject matter knowledge surrounding key laws and regulation regarding consumer privacy and information security. Bob is a certified information privacy professional, uh, awarded from the International Association of Privacy Professionals, with a concentration in US law, Canadian law, information technology, as well as being a certified information privacy manager, or CIPM. He's also a member of the IAPP's faculty, having trained over 10% of the IAPP's membership to date and has served on the Certification Advisory Board for the CIPM program. Uh, finally, most recently, Bob served as the Senior Manager of Worldwide Privacy and Compliance for Staples, uh, the office supply retailer, where his responsibilities included developmental awareness and compliance of global privacy-related policies and procedures for more than 60 business units in 26 different countries. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bob, and he'll take it from here. Thank you, Ben. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about kickstarting a privacy program. And we'll talk about where the origins are coming through um, from a privacy program, you know, what the basis of them are, as well as um, what things um, you need to do to uh, get a privacy program up and running. And this is um, a life cycle type approach. so. If you have a privacy program already, you can use some of these ideas to improve your program and, and help it grow. But to get started, let's talk about where the requirements come from. And that's really the statutes and regulations and other external requirements that you may have, such as contracts coming from your vendors or uh, contracts coming from some of your larger customers. Um, you take these and use these as a basis for developing your privacy program. And when I look at a privacy program, I look at three different um, components. The policies that you generate, the awareness of those policies and training associated with that, and finally validating compliance with those policies that you've created. If you've created the policies properly, those requirements that are coming in from the regulators and statutes and uh, your customers and your, your vendors um, will all be complied with. If when you do your compliance verification. Once you have the program put together, you have to keep in mind that there is a corporate culture that you have, that the policy and the programs associated with it have to be acceptable within your um, organization's culture. Um, even the rollout plan and the training. Uh, for example, at one point I had staff um, in Amsterdam and, and several staffs in, in the United States, how we introduced the program 
in those international locations like in Amsterdam um, was very, very different than what we did here in the U.S. In fact, um, one of my staffs was in uh, Colorado. I had another one in Massachusetts. And the way we introduced the program in Colorado was even different um, than what we did in, in uh, Boston. Um, I go so far as to say that the culture even varies by department. Introducing privacy to an IT department is going to be very different than introducing it to a legal team or to an HR team or a marketing team. So you've got to be sensitive to those cultural aspects of your, of your rollout program and the policy itself as you build your program. Finally, once your program is put together, you're going to implement it. It's, the practice is going to become apparent to the public at large. And um, you're going to start getting some feedback um, from the public about whether things are working or not. That may be in the context of uh, people continuing to do business with you or not. Um, it also may be the public reacting some to some privacy news. Um, in the uh, event you have a data breach, for example, you could expect that there will be a customer loss. In fact, recent studies have shown, and this is from the Poneman Institute, that there's roughly a 3.2% loss of customers after a data breach occurs and things have settled out for a bit. But that public opinion is also related to statutes and regulations. Um, for example, um, as you see, as you've seen with the, uh, the, the Snowden revelations last year, the public has a, a lot to say about how the government is looking at privacy. It's actually um, spurred additional interest in privacy in the private sector as well. So the, then you'll have statutes and regulations and other uh, external requirements changing, which feed back into your policy and the cycle continues. One question I frequently get is, how does privacy relate to security? Again, the, the policies and procedures developed for a privacy program are driven by those external requirements. And those policies and procedures define what needs to be done. So for example, um, if there's a, um, a, a law about protecting um, uh, the PCI DSS, excuse me, statutes, or PCI DSS standards, which protect credit card information, um, talk about protecting credit card numbers in transit through encryption. So the privacy policy may say that credit card information or similar sensitive information needs to be encrypted, whereas the security policy will then take that requirement and define how it gets encrypted and what level of encryption is acceptable to the company. So privacy and security need to work hand in hand. There's a saying that says that you can have security without privacy, but you cannot have privacy without security. So imagine that you want to protect all the information you have. You can put up a, pri a security program with encryption, with access controls, with firewalls, um, with data loss prevention tools, and it will work. But what privacy does is selectively say who can see what information when. And it, the only way to allow that to happen is through a security program, so the, the privacy side cannot stand alone. Okay. So simply creating a privacy policy, I suggest, is simply not enough. Um, you just can't put up a privacy notice, um, a privacy notice being uh, what you might find in a website, something that you're revealing to external stakeholders, like your customers, like regulators. Um, about what you do, you just can't take a privacy notice and put it up and say that's enough. You need to define the internal requirements, the policies and practices, so people in the team know what to do. You need to verify that employees are complying with the policy. You also need to confirm that third-party service providers are complying as well, because your organization is the one that's collecting the information. You're responsible for its protection. You've made that um, commitment in your privacy notice. So no matter where the data resides, you're responsible for making sure that it, it is, in fact, protected. So there is a requirement that you verify that the privacy practices um, held by your um, service providers are, in fact, adequate to meet your requirements. And of course, you also have to provide notice to your customers and other stakeholders um, about how you're protecting information. We'll talk more about um, privacy um, notices in a moment at the end of this uh, session. The privacy notice, uh, privacy program itself needs to constantly evolve. Um, there are regulatory and legislative changes all the time. There are new laws that are coming up. 
Um, there are new regulatory agencies that are coming up. There are new industry self-regulatory concerns that are evolving as well. Your customer, prospect, or other stakeholder requirements are going to change as their organization becomes more sensitive to privacy issues, as their organizations have to respond to their own um, legislative and regulatory requirements. You're, they're going to be responding to that, maybe putting more demands on you as a supplier. The business environment is constantly changing. You're, you may acquire a new company. You may um, divest yourself of a particular business unit. You may go into another line of business. If that's the case, there may be a impact on your privacy program. So, for example, if you are in, say, um, a, a business that is now moving into Canada from the U.S., expanding into Canada or expanding into Europe, there are new laws that you're going to have to deal with. Um, if you're moving into a new line of business, say, something that's healthcare related, you may have to start complying with healthcare laws. And finally, technology is going to change. As technology changes, the privacy program has to make sure that privacy is protected when using that new technology. So, for example, um, when Google Glass came out, you may want you may have wanted to start putting in um, some uh, items in your privacy policy about how your organization responds not only to Google Glass but other wearable technology. On the other hand, you may look at your existing privacy policies and say, well, gee, our policy says that you're not allowed to take photographs within our headquarters premises, and that may be sufficient to cover you with that wearable technology. Okay. Um, as we go through the session, as Ben mentioned, if you have any questions, there is um, a question section on the uh, controls that are with GoToWebinar, so please feel free to post any questions there, and we'll respond to them as we go through the discussion. Okay. Now, if you don't have a privacy program in place, you may be abdicating some of your responsibilities to protect the information. And there are fines that are associated with that. So um, you may have to pay a fine within your, uh, according to whatever your statutes you're um, required to comply with. Um, in fact, if the FTC within the U.S. gets involved, not only may you have to pay a fine, but you may be subject to up to 20 years of oversight of your privacy program and practices. Um, that in itself is a huge cost and a huge impact on an organization. There are data breach remediation costs. You know, how much is it going to take to fix the problem, to address um, the requirements of uh, satisfying your customers whose data was lost, or your employees if their data was lost? On average, in 2013, the Poneman Institute again found that the estimated cost of that was $188 per record. For And that's not looking at the large breaches like Target and Home Depot. This was looking at um, breaches that are of small and mid-size. Now, can you imagine uh, a mid-size business losing records on 1,000 customers? It's $188,000. That's a huge impact to the bottom line. Of course, there's brand damage. There will be le revenue loss. There will be revenue, uh, customer losses. Um, to reacquire those customers, it may take some time. It may take some additional advertising. It may take some additional programs in your place. It may um, require some additional discounting on product um, for customers who have remained loyal. And you may need to expand your marketing to re regain the trust of the public. And then there's organizational reputation damage, um, meaning that it may be difficult to um, keep and then acquire new employees. So you may have employees that leave. Um, highly rated candidates that you're trying to pursue may have a lack of interest because they feel that um, you, you, uh, you're not protecting their information well, let alone the customer's information. Um, in fact, um, when I ask the question, when I give classes, I ask, would you want to go work for a company that's breached. And generally speaking, no one raises their hands, um, except there's usually one or two people um, in, in all the classes I've done that have said, yes, I want to. One of the individuals has said they've been breached. I know their policies are good now. They've been reviewed. The other side of it is that second person who's said, yes, I'm an IT security specialist, and I'm going to make a lot more money working for that company today than I would have uh, um, just a few months ago. So the salary costs are going to be higher. But the increase, there's going to be increased hiring costs. You may need to pay bonuses. You may need to um, have um, higher salaries. You may need to spend more on search firms to find the right people for you. All of that is just because, uh, because you may have had a data breach. You may have not had a good privacy program in place. 
Now, when it comes to starting a privacy program, this is a quick list of the 10 steps that I um, recommend. There's clearly more to a privacy program than this, and we'll talk about some other concerns at the very end of this presentation. But these are the top 10 things I think you need to do. Um, let's take a, take a look at them one at a time. Right at the top, you need to identify an owner. Who's going to be the individual responsible for the privacy program? My recommendation is that this should be someone who's visible and part of the leadership team. It'll show the organization, it'll show your customers and your suppliers how important privacy is to your organization. Um, the owner can't do this alone. That, that leadership member cannot do this alone. Um, they need some assistance. And there are two teams I suggest putting in place. One's called the core team, the second the steering committee. Now, the core team consists of individuals from various business functions around the organization, any part of the organization that may be touching personal information from customers or from employees. So the members of that team will certainly be someone from the privacy office. It'll be um, someone from human resources, someone from IT, somebody from sales, um, somebody from marketing at a minimum. Obviously, the legal team will be involved as well. But you may have somebody there from customer service. Um, you may have someone there who is particularly responsible for um, looking at your data warehouse to get customer information out of it. You want to make sure that all these individuals have a seat at the table. Make sure that the departments um, have a voice in what the privacy program is all about. It would be great if those individuals can have their participation in the privacy program added to their goals. Um, it shows more commitment by their department beyond what the organization has provided. Um, but um, it also gives them part of a charter to drive activities related to privacy within their functional areas. Generally speaking, you see a small number of privacy people in the, in the privacy office that are trying to work with a large organization. In the case of um, the staff I had when I was working at Staples, we had six, seven people to deal with 90,000 associates. I'm working with one Fortune 50 company now that's much more fortunate. They have 25 people, but they're dealing with 160,000 people. So that small number, you can't have everyone everywhere. What you need to do is take advantage of a member of the, of the core team to help you drive your program around the organization. The second team is the steering committee. That's comprised of senior leaders, um, usually peers of the owner. They're the sponsors of the overall privacy program. If someone from their organization or someone anywhere else in the organization comes and talks to them about privacy, they're the ones who are going to show the support. And what they're responsible for is providing just general oversight and direction, for example. What projects should the privacy team work on? What um, events have they seen in the news that they feel that the privacy needs, team needs to delve into to make sure that the organization is protected? They'll review all the policies that you're proposing. Um, make suggestions for modifications for improvement and eventually approve the policy and participate in the rollout of those policies. And most importantly, they'll provide funding and resources to help you along. For example, if your chief marketing officer happens to be part of the steering committee, which I would strongly recommend, um, they can help you to find um, posters and communications and um, marketing type materials to help um, make people aware of what the privacy program is all about. Now that you've got a team in place, you want to take an inventory. You need to figure out what's happening now. With the business in its currently running state, what data is being collected, how it's being used, and how it's shared. So you want to include the data flows of those data elements throughout the organization. It's difficult the first time. I'll admit it. It's time consuming. There, because there is a lot of information that your organization is collecting, number one, and number two, there may be legacy systems that are up and they're running and they haven't been touched for years from an IT perspective. Um, and there may not be anybody who's supporting it full time and knows those, uh, know, know, knows those systems very well. So it will take time for someone to actually look into those systems and investigate how things are working. But once you've created it the first time, it's easy to keep up to date. You take the output of the previous um, the, the previous uh, inventory, send it back to the individual who filled it out for a particular system and ask him to uh, identify any changes. Also, you would um, be able to, at that point, look at any new systems that are being um, upgraded or, or new systems that are being implemented and 
and include that information in the inventory as well. Now, when you're doing the inventory, the things that you want to collect um, are what information is collected, why it's collected, how it's collected, where the information is stored and how it's protected. If the information is shared, figure out how it's shared, why it's shared, and how does a third party protect it. And most importantly, when the information is destroyed and by what process. Many systems don't define the destruction part of things. The reason destruction is so important is because if you destroy information, you can't lose it in the event of a breach. So I had one customer who kept 30 years of information on their customers. And after we talked for a while, um, we figured out when the information really became um, inv uh, unvaluable or not valuable to them. And we were able to reduce um, their amount of paper, their amount of history from 30 years to 10 years. Not only did it reduce the risk associated with potentially losing the data, but it gave them back valuable office space that they were able to um, reduce the size of their footprint on the lease, and it also reduced the amount of storage that they had kept um, in their servers. Again, reducing the amount of uh, cost there because they were able to sell back or give away some of their storage. The other question that I really want to point out to is why. Why the information is collected. There needs to be a good business reason to collect the information. If you don't have one and you don't need the information, why bother collect it? In healthcare, for example, there are many doctors, many hospitals that still collect um, social security number in the U.S., uh, government-issued ID, government insurance IDs. Um, and they do that because uh, years and years ago, that was a unique identifier for each patient to the insurance companies. Today, only government-issued insurance in the U.S., Medicare and Medicaid, require social security number. So there is no reason for someone um, who's not on those programs to have to submit their Social Security number. But the forms that the doctors supply to you ask you to, to provide it. Well, if you're having the Social Security number, you need to protect that adequately. But um, if you aren't, you are susceptible to losing it in a data breach. If you don't ask for it and you don't have it and there's a data breach, obviously you can't lose it. And the way to collect this information is to get the core team involved. Get them to work with the various IT teams and business units to collect the information that you need. Um, and when you do take that inventory, it's easy to talk about electronic information, but let's not forget about the paper information as well. So the core team should reach out to organizations to find out what their business processes are and how personal information is collected because that can con constitute a breach as well. Um, a simple example of that is uh, I was talking to someone just recently and one of their sales reps um, had put um, some papers in his briefcase that contained personal information of their customers, left it on the roof of his car as he filled his trunk with boxes of other, other information. Um, yes, when he got into his car, he left the briefcase on the top and he sped off and a few minutes later, spread throughout the New York State threw away was personal information of this company's customers. Not a good thing. It had to be reported as a data breach. Now that you know what you have internally, you want to take a sem similar inventory to understand your external requirements. And this is going to come from three major areas, legislators, regulators, and business partners. From a legislative standpoint, um, within the United States, you want to take a look, at, for example, at the state data breach laws. There are, uh, there's now 47 state data breach laws. Um, each of them have a slightly different definition of what personal information is. Most of them do focus on electronic information, though, not on paper information. Because when you think about it, when you have a paper-based data breach, the number of affected individuals is much, much smaller than the, than the things that could be lost electronically. In addition, some states have security statutes telling you how the information should be protected. Um, the Massachusetts has the most prescriptive law. They've asked you, um, to find a written information security program, and the Attorney General's office in Massachusetts has examples of what that can look like. Federal laws, on the other hand, cover sector, different sectors of the economy. For example, HR laws, um, for example, uh, GINA for genetic testing, um, wiretaps, um, lie detector tests, background checks, things like that. Um, health, under HIPAA, for example. There are educational 
um, statutes like FERPA to protect student information, COPPA to protect children, and we'll talk more about some of those on the next slide, and of course financial information. Internationally there are laws as well, and there are just two examples here. Um, in the EU there's the Data Protection Directive um, that was put in place in 1995. That's not a law per se, but it um, provides some standards that all of the European Union states were asked to implement as laws within their own countries. Um, so there's some variation across the European Union and how information needs to be protected. But to get an idea of what the standards are, take a look at that particular EU directive. And in Canada, there's PIPEDA, or PAPEDA, if, uh, depending on how you like to pronounce it. It protects personal information. It directs both the government as well as uh, the private sector on how to protect information to meet the standards in Canada. The one thing I do want to call out is that it isn't always easy to transfer information from one, international, one country to another. In the EU, for example, information is protected so well that you need to have um, an agreement or meet certain requirements in order to transfer data. The first uh, requirement that you can meet is adequacy. And what adequacy is, is that the European Union has looked at your country's laws and determined that they would adequately protect um, the information of a European citizen. So your laws would essentially need to be similar to the European laws. Um, there are a number of countries around the world that are adequate. Unfortunately, the United States is not one of them. So within the United States, you need to look at um, one of the other uh, data transfer mechanisms. Safe Harbor is a program that is uh, overseen by the Federal Trade Commission as well as the uh, Department of Transportation. Um, it is voluntary and basically it, uh, it is a way for an individual company to say that they are adequate under European law. And a company will self-attest to that fact um, and that will allow them to bring information from Europe to the United States. However, it cannot go outside of the United States under safe harbor. Other mechanisms are model contracts or data transfer agreements, um, which are essentially contracts and agreements which talk about how information can be protected, uh, will be protected, and uh, once that's approved by um, the, the, the authorities in Europe, you can uh, then tra transfer information um, from a European company to a U.S. company. Um, and then finally, just binding corporate rules. Um, that is an enterprise definition of how your organization will protect information. It applies to not only the U.S., but anywhere that your organization is working around the world. Um, and that would allow you to export data from Europe to any or part of your organization, no matter where it is geographically. You need to look at the regulations also. So um, here's a list of some laws and some regulations that would apply to protecting information. I mentioned the payment card industry data security standards earlier. Um, it's defined by the PCI Security Standards Council, which is made up of um, all the different brands of credit cards. Um, it's enforced by the credit card brands and the credit card transaction acquirers, uh, meaning the people who you uh, send those credit card transactions to for approval. It has uh, a dozen requirements which break down into over 400 criteria that you need to meet if you are um, collecting uh, credit card information and keeping it in your systems. There are ways to minimize the number of requirements, um, for example, using a third party to collect the credit card information for you and you only record the uh, authorization code. There's HIPAA, our health healthcare law here in the U.S. Um, it has two parts to it that apply to privacy. Um, one is the privacy rule and the other is security rule. The security rule only um, applies to electronic um, protected health information, whereas the privacy rule applies to all protected health information. And health information in this case is de defined as any information relating to someone's medical conditions, the treatment or payment of that, uh, those conditions. So it, it's, it's very broad, a very broad definition. And it is enforced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights. In financial sector, there's Graham Bleach, Graham Bleach Bliley Act, um, which was um, also known as the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999. Um, it's enforced by the FTC as well as several other um, regulatory agencies, depending on um, what type of uh, institution you are. Um, 
but it does define um, that how you protect information defines protected information as any information relating to a um, financial account. There was an additional law, Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act that was passed. That introduced the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which has now stepped in and is providing regulation in conjunction with those other regulatory agencies. And finally, from a children's standpoint, and there's COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule. Uh, and it regulates how, when you can collect a child's personal information. So a child is defined as an individual under the age of 13. And if you uh, encounter someone visiting your website that is of that age, you need to get um, verifiable parental permission in order to collect their personal information. And this, again, is enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. <laughs> there are organizations that are out there that can help you get that verifiable uh, parental permission because it is um, uh, quite um, onerous on an organization to do that on their own. And then finally, there's partners. Customers are gonna, may have some unique requirements. Um, you'll usually find those within the, cust the contracts you have with the customers. Um, anything that is in the customer contract overrides whatever privacy notice you've published. So you need to take an inventory there and make sure those exceptions are all noted by the appropriate um, departments in your organization. Because um, if you violate what the contract's asking for, obviously you're violating the contract and may have repercussions to being able to do business with that customer. The same thing's true with vendors. They may have requirements. Um, the one that I've seen most often is that they want to um, obtain some personal information um, from a sales standpoint um, so that you, they can give your organization more favorable pricing. The thing that a privacy person needs to do is balance what the vendors are asking for against what commitments have been made to customers to make sure you're not violating your privacy notice or any contractual agreements. And finally, there's service providers. The service providers obviously may be processing some personal information for you, so they'd obviously have to uh, have that in-house. The question becomes, how are they protecting that information? What do they need from you as an organization to make sure the information is protected properly? That may have an impact um, on your privacy program as well. So therefore, you need to understand what those examples are. So now you have the requirements from um, regulators and your, your business partners and the, and the law. You know what information you're collecting do, uh, to do. Um, to uh, do your, your processing from uh, your biz various business units, it's time to define your policy. And I think of a privacy policy as something that's very high level. It, def it defines what the right thing to do is within an organization and leaves the details to supporting documentation. Okay. So aside from the fact that it pr introduces some stability to the privacy policy, it also engages the different parts of the organization to help define what those standards are, what those what that supporting documentation is, so you can take advantage of their expertise and engage them in the privacy policy and pol privacy program. Okay. Um, the, a couple of key things you need to define that if the privacy policy is violated, what the consequences to the individual violating it are. For example, you may end up saying that, um, that the, uh, and this is what happens most often, is that um, violation of this policy is subject to, um, uh, subject to, I'm, I'm <laughs> loss of words, that it's, it's subject to corrective action up into including termination. And that would apply not only to employees, but also to contractors as well, because they might violate the policy, so you would terminate the contract with them. Okay. And also, there may be times where the policy can't be met for one reason or another. Maybe it's temporary, maybe it's longer term. So you need to identify an exception process for the policy. And the idea there would be not necessarily to grant an exception, but to grant an exception with compensating controls so that people would be able to still accomplish their, their goal to meet the business objectives, but uh, making sure the information is still protected too. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, there's supporting documentation 
uh, below the policy. And those are generally processes, standards, and guidelines, where a process is a step-by-step -step instruction of how something should, might be accomplished. A standard is the minimum requires to be met, it, that needs to be met in order to uh, be compliant with the policy. Um, exceeding those standards obviously should absolutely be encouraged. And guidelines are just suggestions about how things should be done. So for example, if you're sending information um, to a third party, and part of that requirement in the privacy policy is that information in transit, personal information in transit, needs to be encrypted, a process may be a step-by-step -step procedure on how to encrypt data prior to sending it via email. The standard might say that you need to use 256-bit encryption to encrypt information, personal information before it is sent by email. And the guideline might be, here's a tool that you can use to encrypt personal information before you send it via email. Within each of their areas, the core team members should take the lead on having these policies and procedures and, excuse me, procedure standards and guidelines defined. However, it would be a great idea to have the core team review the, the standards, guidelines, and procedures as a step either in pro uh, as approval or oversight. This will allow other parts of the organization to take advantage of work that's already been done so that you don't have different processes, standards, and guidelines used by different parts of the organization to achieve the same goal. That uniformity is going to make it much easier to manage the process. It's going to be much easier to transfer people from organization to organization, which they will do occasionally. Um, and it will also make it easier to enforce your guidelines. Okay. Some key items that uh, you need to have processes standard guidelines about are your data retention standards. When does the information no longer valuable to the, the organization? When are you no longer legally required to keep it? At that point, it's time to get rid of it. And the next standard associated with that would be your data destruction standard. How do you destroy information? Is it enough to take it and throw it in the trash? Do you need to shred it? Or does it need to go into a locked bin to ensure that it's getting shredded and then uh, further made unreadable? There are laws around the U.S. about how data needs to be destroyed in various states. Um, you should put an incident management process in place. What to do when a breach happens. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the, at the end of this session. And a crisis management process, basically defining who talks to law enforcement, who talks to employees, who talks to the press throughout um, a breach occurring. And it's, um, again, we'll talk more about that as well at the end of this session. Uh, the sixth step is to train the staff. Asking the staff simply to read documentation is very ineffective. Um, think about all the email you get on a particular day. Think about all the programs you, you're asked to comply with on a particular day. Um, it, it just it doesn't help to just send out some documentation and ask people to read it. Either they won't read it or um, they may misunderstand it. Formal, face -to formal training is needed. It could be either face-to-face -face training or a webinar like this. Um, it could be, be computer-based. Any of those mechanisms work. In fact, um, working with one Fortune 50 customer now that we're training 2,000 members of their staff, including everyone who reports to the uh, chairman of the board and the CEO. Um, when you do provide the training, Talk about practice scenarios. Let people apply the, the, the things that they just learned um, so that they know how to react and, and know what the right thing to do is and the consequences of the wrong thing to do while complying with the privacy notice, privacy policy. Training should occur right, right away when the program is initially introduced. Anytime somebody joins the organization, they should be trained. Everybody on an annual basis, and I underline everybody, there should be no one exempt from it, even members of your privacy team, should take a refresher course on an annual basis. And that, that attendance should be logged so that you can show a regulator, if it's required, that your privacy program is in place and everyone's been trained. And don't forget about contractors and temporary employees. They have access to your personal information as well. I can't tell you the number of times I've walked on site to an organization, they let me have access to their network. Um, I worked with, without giving me any training and not telling me what the guidelines were. In fact, I walked onto one site, they gave me a company-owned laptop because they wouldn't, from a security standpoint, let me use my laptop to connect to a network. And I asked about privacy policies and notices, and they said, you'll find them on our portal, and that was the end of my training. That is really not sufficient. You need to... Um, you need to make sure that either there's an onboarding process for those contractors and temporary employees, or alternatively, make sure that the manager who those individuals are assigned to provide that training. Okay. 
And finally, you should um, you should supplement that formal training with an ongoing awareness program. And awareness programs are um, informal ways of communicating. So posters, blogs, emails, um, newsletters, um, and there are more creative things you can do as well that will keep privacy top of mind. Remember, I referred to all those emails you get, all those programs you have to comply with as part of your daily life at a company. An awareness program will keep bringing people back to privacy so that they, in fact, know what's um, happening. So you know what your policies are, you know what your basic procedures and standards and guidelines are. It's time to look at what your third-party vendors are doing. Um, the organization, as I said before, is responsible for data it collects no matter where it resides, whether it's in your possession, whether it's in the possession of a third party, whether that third party is transferred it to a subprocessor, as well as when the information is in transit. So the questions you have to ask, the basic questions you need to ask, is are the third parties meeting your new policies? If they're not, are they willing to meet the new requirement? If not, how do you get them to remediate the situation or compensate for the requirements that are not being met? And finally, you need to be willing to cut the tie with that third party and to find someone else who can meet those requirements. Now, there may be only one vendor who can meet your requirements for some particular reason. You need to spend the time with them and not necessarily give in um, to say you're going to work the way they want to work. You need to find some way that your organization is comfortable with the way the information is being protected so that in the event that that third party has a data breach, your position is at least defensible when it comes to having reviewed the situation and try to remediate any gaps. A way to do this is to ensure that third parties understand your new requirements. Hold a webinar series for about your new policy. Invite all of your vendors there. Require that your vendors have a point of contact that is responsible for privacy or responsible for security. And finally, hold individual meetings with your key partners, the ones that are getting the most of your personal information. You want to make sure that they're aware and participating as much as they possibly can um, because um, you're so reliant on them. Follow up with a questionnaire you can create about the privacy program. You can create one yourself, or you can find one out on, on the web that might be useful for you. One organization I use for assessments, and have used for assessments in the past, is, is, can be found on sharedassessments.org. It's sharedassessments.org. And finally, the contracts that you have with your vendors and your service providers should require compliance should require that your privacy programs are being met. This is uh, actually required by some state laws. It's also required by some um, international laws. But it will not necessarily be easy to get all of your vendors to agree to this. It's going to become a negotiation point. You've got to find a happy medium where they can meet what you're asking for and, and you're comfortable with the protections in place. I would suggest if you're looking for a new third party, a new vendor to come on board, make sure the privacy requirements, the security requirements are included in the request for proposals. That way people will self-select out if in fact they can't meet those requirements. At this point, it's time to declare victory and celebrate. People have worked really hard to get you to the point you are now. You're ready to launch the program formally um, to the outside world. Um, you know your information has been protected, or at least you have the gaps analyzed um, for what's been, uh, what, what is in place. The, uh, the, the, the celebration and the, um, will um, bring more awareness to the company because they will know what's happening. They will see the effort that's been put in and will show how important it is to the organization as a whole and you will be able to announce the next step, which is to post the notice to your customers. Let the privacy notice um, get up on your website. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a privacy statement or a privacy policy on the website, but it is um, in, the, in the privacy practice, if you will, referred to as a privacy notice. Um, it tells people how, what information you collect, how you collect it, how you protect it, how you destroy it, who you share it with. It can be used very much as a strategic tool. It can, it, you can specify why, what differentiates, different, differentiates your privacy program. Sorry about that. Um, for example, you may say that you don't sell data or you don't share data with anyone. That's unique. Most organizations have some level of sharing in place. Um, 
you can use it as an educational platform. I saw one website that had a privacy notice in place that also had information for consumers and how privacy can affect them in their daily lives. And since this was at a retailer site, it pointed back to products that would help consumers protect their own information. So it became a sales tool, not only an educational platform. Okay, things you'd include in a privacy notice, when do you collect the personal information, why you collect it, what's collected, how it's protected, who you share the information with, and when you share it, um, a way to get for a consumer to have their questions answered, who, um, who to contact for that information, how do you agree to the privacy program, opting into it, or how do you pull yourself out of sharing information, opting out of it. Um, what should someone do if they think there's a problem? Um, you may even have the contact information for a credit reporting agency in place um, on there, all three major credit reporting agencies, so people can look things up. And then you want to have an effective date. When does this privacy pro notice take effect? Is it effective today, or is it, um, or, um, is it something that's going to be effective sometime in the future? It's also a way of versioning your privacy notice, so that you understand when people um, have decided, uh, or when they shared information, what the ground rules were at that time. And the final step is uh, to review, reassess, and revise. <laughs> As I mentioned before, the business and pri uh, privacy landscape changes all the time. Your business may expand into new markets. You may go into new geographies. Lawmakers and regulators change new, tech, uh, new requirements. And there's technology that gets introduced, new technology your company may use or new technology that the company may um, take advantage of. Um, the, techno the changes in technology as technology involves all, usually does um, include some in enhanced privacy risk, but the legislation, the regulators may not be able to keep up with it. So it's up to the privacy team to figure out what's the right thing to do for your company. I'd suggest that even two companies that are in the same market, subject to the same regulators, doing the same kind of business, will have different approaches to privacy because they have different tolerance to risk. They will have different uh, infrastructure in place. So therefore, they have to come up with their own strategy. You should review your privacy program annually in a formal way. Um, there are some regulatory and legislative requirements to do this. Um, I do suggest that you do an independent assessment. Um, what tends to happen if the privacy office is doing the assessment on their own, they'll go and they'll talk to people about what's happening and they'll, they may listen um, with uh, uh, or look at things through rose-colored glasses. I know what this person is telling me that we don't meet the requirements, but I know what we really do does meet the requirements, so I'm going to say it meets the requirements. Having somebody come from the outside um, removes those rose -colored rose-colored glasses. Also, in my experience, people tend to be more forthright with someone coming from the outside for, as opposed to someone internally um, because there's less fear of retribution, if you will, if someone from the outside is listening. Now, privacy needs to be considered a, a process of continuous improvement um, to be responsive to those environmental changes I mentioned before. That reviewing the privacy policy should be based on a gap analysis, where you are today versus where you want to be in the future. And deciding where the investment should go should be risk-based. The higher the risk, the more you should be willing to spend or the, more, the quicker you should be willing to respond to the requirement. Now, there are a couple of other considerations. Um, ongoing compliance is important. <laughs> As new processes get introduced, new programs get introduced, um, you want to provide some oversight of that within the privacy organization. So that means... Um, the, uh, establishing a process where the privacy team is notified about new initiatives that are being undertaken. Um, one tool that is out there that you can use to provide this oversight and understand what's going on is a uh, privacy impact assessment. Um, I can spend a whole hour easily, if not a whole day, talking about privacy impact assessments. Um, so just to name it right now um, is, is a start. If you're interested in hearing more about it, uh, please give us a call. We'll be happy to chat with you about it. You, as I mentioned before, you want to keep that data inventory current. You also want to keep the legislative inventory current. Um, for the latter, there are organizations out there that provide alerts to changes in policies, uh, excuse me, in uh, regu regulations and uh, laws. And of course, you want to think about doing assessments of your organization or auditing your organization, as I mentioned in that last section. You want to make sure that the company is doing the right thing. 
Earlier I mentioned about incident management and breach response. Um, you need to have a technical response plan. That incident management plan I mentioned earlier needs to be put in place. How do you determine whether there really was a breach or not? Um, if, there, if there was, what are the steps that need to be taken? Who has the technical responsibilities to control the, the bleeding, if you will, and forensically isolate the system? From a communication standpoint, who's going to be talking to law enforcement? Who's going to be talking to the media? All of that's important so that a consistent message is given across the board, and that communications plan can help you do it. And I can't emphasize this too much. Test it. Do a tabletop exercise several times during the year to find out what's going on and what works and what doesn't. I guarantee you the first time you go through a tabletop exercise, you're going to go back to your plan and have to do some major revisions. And hopefully subsequent tests will not require as many revisions, but I'm sure there will be updates. And again, just repeating, you, you need to have an ongoing training and awareness program, um, annual formal training for everyone that's logged, as well as an ongoing informal awareness program. Um, January 28th every year is uh, Data Privacy Day. Uh, we happen to be a sponsor of Data Privacy Day today. The uh, program is driven by the National uh, Cybersecurity Alliance. Um, but it's an opportunity for you to celebrate Data Privacy Day and bring awareness to your company about what's going on there. Um, we can help you do that. You can also go to staysafeonline.org for ideas on how to, to uh, have that celebration. So just to wrap up, those are the 10 steps that we look at to uh, kickstart a privacy program. You can jump in anywhere um, that you want and uh, take it uh, from a stop. Uh, uh, take it to improve your program from there. Um, at this point, we're going to go take a look at any questions that there are. Um, Ben's handed me one here. Um, this one reads, uh, you reference steering committees with senior managers being involved. If I'm part of a small business, such as one with 10 or fewer a few employees, what other options do I have besides including everyone or just having one person in charge? Um, if, if your company is that small with 10 people involved, um, one person can certainly take the lead, um, but um, you want to make sure everybody buys into it. You know, smaller companies tend to be more family-like, more cohesive. They want to do things together. So um, it, it probably will not take as much time from those 10 people, as you might find in a larger organization, but certainly having them participate in it is, is, is good enough. In the, an organization that size, and the, to be candid, the smallest organization I've worked with is 30 people. Um, we established a steering committee in that 30-person organization that consisted of five people um, from each of the departments in the organization, and we got buy-in from them as well. The largest steering committee that I worked with is, um, oh goodness, I think it was 35 people in that. A um, little bit more coordination, but it certainly got it, um, everybody involved. Okay. Um, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to put them in the questions box. We'll, we'll answer it now. If we don't get a chance to answer it, um, we'll certainly uh, be in touch to follow up. Um, we are offering to every attendee to take advantage of a free 30-minute consultation. To sign up for that, simply email us at info at privacyref.com. Um, if you have questions um, or comments subsequent to um, this this uh, webinar, you can send that to info at privacyref.com as well, or you can contact me directly at bob.siegel at privacyref.com. So at this point, I don't see any other questions. I'm looking for Ben to, oh, there it is. Uh, we just got one more. Um, this one reads, what pitfalls should be avoided when writing a privacy notice for the first time? Um, I'll highlight two. It's a good question. Um, the first one to avoid is copying somebody else's privacy notice. That happens very, very frequently. And it turns out that when you do copy it over, some of the things in that privacy notice may not apply to your organization. Um, and therefore, it doesn't make sense to have in your, in your privacy notice. Also, you may not meet the requirements that are in that privacy notice. And um, if, the FTC, if something happens and the FTC receives a complaint, for example, or two or three, you may be held um, for action by the FTC as either an unfair or deceptive trade practice. Um, the other aspect that you should avoid when writing a privacy notice for the first time is not to be too specific. You want to be able to put the privacy notice up that conveys to the stakeholders 
what information you, uh, you collect and what you do to protect it and process it, but you don't want to be so specific that every time you change a vendor or every time you change an internal process that you have to go change that privacy notice. It will be too confusing to your um, customers. Um, I'm looking over to Ben, see if there are any other questions. And it doesn't appear to at this time. So with that, I want to thank you all for attending today. There is a short survey that will pop up uh, when we complete this, uh, this webinar. Um, please take a few minutes to fill it out. It will help us uh, bring um, forward some new offerings and free webinars and obviously help us better convey information to you. And we are looking forward to speaking to you in one of our, uh, our uh, consultations. Thanks again for your time.